take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 5. <clears throat> Don't worry, husbands. <laughs> That's about so the latter section of that is husband love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. <clears throat> We're going to stop right before we get there. We're not going to look at any of that. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> I want to share a message with you. The will of the Lord. The will <clears throat> of the Lord. Ephesians 5. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient or suitable, but rather giving a thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Notice verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, or what's pleasing to Him. And have no fellowship, verse 11, chapter 5 of Ephesians, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, God says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly or cautiously, not as fools, but is wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Verse 17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to, to open up your precious word. Lord, it is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And God, we need you to shine brightly before us today the way that we should go. Lord, for some of us that means a brokenness and a contrite heart and an altar of repentance, realizing that we have not walked the way of Christ, but we've walked our own way. Lord, for others it may be, a, a Lord, that they would come to you today and meet you as their Savior, their Lord. This would be the day that they would have the new birth, born again from above, not of man, but of the will of God. Lord, for others, it may be a, a time of, of, of challenge, a reproof, a correction. Lord, that we once again could see the way that we ought to go and, and Lord, energetically walk in that way so that we would please you. But we ask, God, that you would, for Christ's sake, allow the Holy Ghost to to, to teach us your word today and speak to us about our own relationship with you and help us to see the need in our life. And Lord, help us to respond to you today. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. <clears throat> in most of the Pauline epistles, that is, the letters that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, wrote, 
he begins first of all with great, deep doctrinal truths. You'll see that in this book especially in Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. You'll find the phrase, in Christ. It's just two words, but what a tremendous topic. What a great revelation. What a deep doctrine. It's mentioned ten times, that little phrase, in Christ, but if you go back and include in whom or in him, it's repeated over and over again. It's a great truth that you and I need to get our hearts and minds around. But once Paul lays down a solid, deep uh, uh, foundation of doctrine, he usually goes to the practical Christian living. I like that. Uh, he doesn't just leave us with mystical, spiritual truths. He said, now I want to show you how to live every day. What it is to actually live a Christian life. A phrase you may have heard years ago, where the rubber meets the road. You know, this is what it's all about. What are we supposed to do now that we are in Christ and saved and on our way to heaven? What kind of life are we to live I think you find that, and I would challenge you to go back and study Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. I think you'll find it laid out for you in these chapters. The will of the Lord. What is it that God demands of me? Now that I'm saved, what does He want of me? Is that all that He wanted was to keep me out of hell and now, basically, I can just float through life, do as I please, and then one day when that day finally comes and I die, I go to heaven. Is that what the Christian life is all about? I plead with you, I beg with you, I beseech you that you listen to the Word of God and you'll see, no, a thousand times, no, God forbid that that would be the attitude that we have concerning the Christian life, right? Amen. Here in the passages that are before us, uh, Paul includes the truth. Notice what he says in verse number four, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore. So he starts to change the tune. If all this is true, therefore. And I'm sure Brother Owen has said this before. I know I've heard other preachers say this before. My own father-in-law my pastor for years said this. If you've been in church and you've heard this phrase, I want you to participate by raising your hand. How many times have you heard a preacher or a Bible teacher say, when you see the little word, therefore, find out what it is there for? Have you ever heard a preacher say that? How many of y'all have heard that? All right. Most of you have, right? That means I've said all of this to say this. Right? Wherefore? Because of this, now, listen to me. You see that? And so Paul now wants to move you and I into thinking, I'm in Christ, saved, I'm sitting in heavenly places with Him. Hallelujah. Saved by grace, not by works. Praise God. He's broken down the middle wall of petition. I mean, I can come to Him and He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that I ask or think, Ephesians 3. Therefore, <laughs> so what's that first little command that He gives us? The pri I, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech thee that thou walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And see, Paul says, I am a prisoner of Christ. He is my Lord. You know, I don't try to use Greek too much because I don't know much Greek at all. This is the joke. I know a, a little fellow that has a restaurant, a Greek restaurant. I don't know the words that well. I do, you know, I handle English poorly myself. But that is curios, Lord. I'm a prisoner of curios, which means he to whom a person or thing belongs. Why did Paul always refer to himself as 
the prisoner of the Lord, a servant of Christ. We've kind of made that word a little bit nicer in our day because we hate the ideal of slavery. So we made it a little bit nicer in our Bibles, right? A servant of Christ. It means a slave of Christ. He is my master. I am his slave. I, I love being a son. Don't get me wrong. I love being a child of a God, joint heir with Christ. Amen? Amen? But I also need to realize something. He is curious. He is Lord. I belong to Him. Is that a true Bible doctrine or not? Yeah. Right? In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, what does it say? What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which you have of God, and you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Bought. You are bought. You are bought, purchased with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Not that you are God. It belongs to Him. You are His purchased possession. That gives you a little bit more of understanding about what is this Christian life about. First of all, the will of the Lord is that you submit or bow before Him. You say, preacher, how should I live my Christian life? You should live your Christian life knowing that you are purchased by the blood of Christ and He owns you completely you are His to do with you according to His will. Amen? I mean, whatever His will is for me, preacher, that's what I want. That's the attitude of someone who knows the Lord. Right? Someone who is genuinely saved doesn't say, well, I'll go here, do this, and I'll live this way, I'll, got, I'll go here, I'll do that, and they never even consider the Lord. Are y'all with me on that? Someone who is genuinely saved, they say, Lord, where do you want me to live? Who do you want me to marry? What do you want me to do? What kind of college degree should I pursue? If Should I even go to college? Right? I think we've kind of lost that concept, haven't we? We like the Santa Claus Jesus. Amen? To show up and give us a bunch of blessings and then depart and let us enjoy our blessings all by ourselves. Is that what Christianity is about? No. So the first thing Paul pleads with them about is to acknowledge that He is Lord and that we are to bow before Him. You see the Bible... Salvation brings us back. What it does, it brings us back to what the reality was before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, man lived for his Creator. Adam and Eve loved their God. They lived for their God. They walked with Him and talked with Him and had fellowship with Him. Their only purpose for existing was God until they sinned. And then their purpose for existence was what Adam and Eve wanted. Right? And now we are infected with that same sin problem. It's running through all of our veins. The flesh always wants to take control. It always wants to be in charge. That's not its place anymore. If you're saved, its place is underneath the heel of Christ and His authority and lordship and will for your life. By the way, that's a wonderful place to be. In a right relationship with God, you can't get any better than that. But you're not going to have that relationship with Him if you're saying, no, I want to be independent of you. Walk worthy of your calling. Live in such a way that that calling, your Christian life, can demonstrate to others the greatness of Jesus, the glory of Christ, the wonder of our Savior. That's how we're to be living 
We're to live in such a way that we lift up Him. And, we, and everybody says, wow, boy, they're consumed with this Christ. He must be valuable. Sadly, in our day, we don't see too many people that are consumed with Christ, do we? Is that true or not? <coughs> it's the heart of salvation, by the way, right? <coughs> you see, some people say, you've probably met people, I want you to participate in this as well. How many of you have met people, are you listening, that say they're a Christian and they don't really live anything like it? How many of you met people like that? They say, I'm a Christian. But everywhere they go and everything they do, you don't see Christ at all in that. We've all met people like that. And sadly, some of us may be able to raise our hand and say, you know what, preacher, that's kind of the way I live now. If you watched me and looked, and, 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 and looked over me, you wouldn't see too much of Jesus in that. I hope that we'd have a hard time raising our hand, but that's kind of the reality sometimes, isn't it? But we forget that's the fundamental truth of what salvation is. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. You all like it when I waddle up here, you know? I mean, that's a sight. No video cameras, please. <coughs> Romans 10, 9 and 10. Remember that? That's the end of that Romans road that we're to use to help everybody come to Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Listen to what verse number... 9 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That little word confess, we went over that Wednesday night here at church. It's the same word you find in 1 John 1, 9. Who knows what that verse says? You want to quote it for us, 1 John 1, 9? Come on. I don't know. I, there's somebody that has to be a little bit brave. I know you know it. I started out. If we confess, He is faithful. Hallelujah. I knew y'all knew that. <laughs> if we confess our sins, what does that mean, preacher? I just go and I say, hey, Brother Owen, you know, I really messed up the other day. You know, I did this and I did that. And Brother Owen says, well, Tommy, just pray and God forgive you. Oh, thank you, Brother Owen. I, I'm glad I got that off my chest. Is that what that confession means? No, <clears throat> that word confession, again, you, you look it up in the Greek, it starts out with homo. It's not, it doesn't end with sexual, though. Aren't you glad? <laughs> but it does start out homo. It means one. And what it's saying is this. Listen to me now. There's a point here. The word confess means that I am to say what God is saying about my sin. And if I don't ever say what He's saying about my sin, there is no forgiveness for my sins. I have to agree with Him. I have to say, God, you're right. That is sin. That is awful. It's terrible. It's wrong. You're right. I should have never done it. If we don't say what he says, if we, and I don't mean you have to say the same thoughts that he said. I'm saying you have to agree with him that what you did was wrong in order for you to get forgiveness. So what are we saying here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, God is saying, listen, now you need to say the same thing about Jesus too. He's not just someone who came into this earth, a virgin born, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, resurrected early Sunday morning, and ascended back into heaven, will return someday soon, maybe today. He is curious, Lord. He is the one in charge. He is the master. He is God. He's the boss. What he says goes. It's not just his wishful thoughts. It's his holy commands. Isn't that true? If you're going to be saved, you have to come and bend the knee to Christ and say, Christ, I bow before you and accept you as my Lord and Savior. You're the boss. Now listen, that don't mean that you're going to do everything perfectly right and it takes that to get to heaven. If that was the case, nobody would make it to heaven. 
But you can't come any other way than to say you're in charge of my life. Now, I may not do a good job obeying you, but I want you to know something. You're the boss and I'm the servant. And you can't come any other way to Jesus and think that you're going to have genuine salvation experience. You say, preacher, how do you know that's true? I know it's true because Jesus said there's a broad way that leads to destruction and many go in thereat. You say, well, how's that, Lord? He said, well, let me tell you, in chapter 21 of Matthew chapter 7, there'll be many that say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, preached in your name? Have not we done many wonderful works in your name? And listen to this, have we not even cast out devils in your name? And Jesus said, that's what they'll be telling me. Lord, Lord, we've preached the gospel. Lord, Lord, we've done good things. Lord, Lord, we've cast out demons. And Jesus said, I will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You're saying, Lord, now, but you didn't live like I was Lord, did you? You didn't accept me as Lord. You just wanted a ticket out of hell. And when you thought you had that, you put it in your back pocket somewhere, never to be pulled out again, and you live the rest of your life for yourself. That's not salvation, friend. What did Jesus say about being a disciple? If any man come after me. You say, preacher, I want to be a Christian Genuine Christian, I want to go to heaven when I die. If any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up my cross. Follow me. Can I ask each of us something? You say, preacher, I prayed a prayer, ask Jesus in, as my Savior. Can I ask you something? I want you to search your heart. Have you denied yourself? Are you still living for yourself? Is there anything in your life that is for Christ? By the way, it shouldn't be just one or two items that you point to if He's Lord, right? There should be a multitude of things you point to. Preacher, I live here because of Christ. I work here because of Christ. I attend church uh, at this place or that because of Christ. I, I live. Everything you can point your finger to, preacher, that's because of Jesus. Right? Isn't that what the Bible demands out of us? Deny himself. Have you taken up his cross? Do you bear his image even though the world is ridiculing it in our day? Do you stand up and tell others that you go to school with or work with our neighbors, I am a Christian and I belong to Jesus, even as they laugh and mock and sneer? Do you still stand boldly for him? And are the third thing, is it true? Are you pursuing him? Are you trying to become more like Jesus? Let me say something. If you can't say that, don't tell me that you are one of his disciples, right? What is the will of the Lord? Well, it's first of all that he be Lord. Does that make sense? That you let him dictate to you how to live, what to do. By the way, it goes, it touches every area of life. Is that true? Why did Jesus say to those in his day, why call you me Lord, Lord, and what do you, how do you end that? And do not the things which I say. He'll go on in Matthew 27, 21 further and say, there's a wise man build his house on a solid foundation. What is that foundation? It's what he does, what I tell him to do. He obeys my will. Is that true? Y'all, am I twisting the scriptures just trying to prove a point or I'm laying before you what the Bible teaches? He's laying before you what the Bible teaches. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Back up back there, whoever that was. <laughs> That's the basis of salvation, right? A Christian... A true Christian could only live 
under, under, under the authority of Christ. Look at verse, uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians. Look at verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk and the vanity of their mind. Listen to me, what is that saying? Is that just a verse and a passage? No, we'll read that. What does it say? He's saying this. Listen to me. He's saying this. Don't you dare live like the world lives. Is that what he's saying? Don't live like the world lives. Don't live like the unsaved live. Listen, verse 18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, that is all excess of wickedness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Listen, verse 20, verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. That's not how Christ lives. So is that what Paul's trying to teach you or not? Understanding the will of the Lord. What is that? That Christ is the one that's in charge and that you start living your life for Jesus Christ. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. You know, some people go to church and they get a lot out of it. Right? Some people read their Bible and they get a lot out of it. And if you're a young, immature Christian, <coughs> you're struggling... You're going to get some. Don't let this illustration just uh, discourage you. You're going to get some things that's going to help you. I want to tell you what's going on if you're saved. There's going to be a hunger in your heart for it. Amen? But there's a story told of uh, two men that lived in the United Kingdom. One man's name was William Pitt, the younger. He was one of the greatest prime ministers in the United Kingdom. His, fr his friend was William Wilberforce. Yes, that same William Wilberfor Wilberforce that um, liberated the slaves. William Wilberforce. He had a genuine... William Wil Wilberforce had a genuine experience of salvation. He was a truly converted Christian. When you hear the world saying, hey, in the Bible there's slavery... You can also stand up and say, hey, the reason it's not in the world today is because of Christianity. <laughs> and he was a genuine, godly man, and he kept trying to get his friend William Pitt to go to church with him. And every time he invited William Pitt, the friend, to go to church with him, he always come up with some kind of excuse. I have this business appointment here, I have these meetings there. He was underneath the ministry of Richard Cecil, an uh, evangelistic preacher of the gospel, and Wilberforce was praying that Pitt would come and hear his preaching. Well, finally one day arrived. He didn't have anything planned that day, so we and Pitt went to church with him. And while Brother Cecil was preaching, William Wilberforce was sitting there thinking, wow, this is amazing, that's good, God's anointing is there, God is just speaking wonderful words of life, and and the unction of God is on the preacher. This is amazing. It's good. I'm glad he's here, especially today. After the service, when they got out in the vestibule, William Pitt made this comment about the services. He said, you know, William, I have not the slightest idea what that man has been talking about. To him it was nothing but just words, dead words, unimportant words, common, uninteresting words. I want words that tell me how to scheme and get and gain and live and be powerful and successful in the world. I don't want to hear words that talk about dying and, and uh, being under his authority. It didn't benefit him whatsoever. He left as though nothing was ever said. And by the way, he professed to be a Christian. He said, I'm a Christian. Never got anything out of 
God's Word being delivered to him through the, pre- the, the instrument that God has chosen. You understand what I'm saying? Here's a man who's in Christian name only, but nothing is on the inside. Please don't die in that kind of state. What is the will of the Lord? First of all, it is that you bow. Secondly, it is that you imitate. Now, I'm, I'm saying imitate this way. That means that you try to do as Christ has done. Look at chapter 5 and verse 1. Be ye therefore... You see, do you see a connection here? If we, Ephesians 4, 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. Chapter 5. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. You know what Paul's saying? <laughs> Some of you probably have that in your Bibles, a little word written out underneath or near that verse. Uh, anybody have that? That word follower translated in your Bible. Anybody? What do you have beside that? Imitators. You know what? You know what Paul's saying? Paul is saying the will of the Lord is that you imitate the life of Christ. <clears throat> Are y'all with me on that? God's will for you is Christ be Lord. God's will for you is that you live like Christ. Imitate Christ. By the way, there is no example like the the example Christ gave to us. Amen? Amen. Now, I know what some of you are thinking already. Preacher, there ain't no way in the world I can live like Christ. I mean, He was perfect. He never sinned. Can I tell you what? We ought to all be stretching toward that. Agreed? We all, all of us ought to be saying, well, how can I be like that? Not live as you please, do as you please, go where you please. No, I should be trying daily to imitate the life of Christ. Listen to me. If we all, as Christians, did that, when you went to work, they, people at work would see, wow, there's a change in your life. You no longer talk like that. Why is that? And you would say to them, honestly, that's because I'm trying to be more like Christ. Well, I notice that you don't just take that little extra change and put it in your pocket anymore. Why is that? Because I'm trying to imitate Christ. Christ would not do that. Hey, I know that you don't have any girlfriends on your phone anymore. Why is that the case? Because Christ wouldn't do that. And I'm trying to imitate Christ. And by the way, at your work, showing up on time, doing a full day's work, giving your employer everything that they require, all of that is imitating Christ because that's exactly what Christ would do. And by the way, I'm not just guessing at that. That's what the Bible teaches. Be therefore imitators. Mimic. What am I supposed to be doing? I'm a Christian now. What am I supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be behaving yourself like Christ in every situation life brings your way. In your home. You know, in just a little bit he'll talk about the home, but he's going to say this about the home. Listen to me. He's going to say, listen, the lesson here is not about the home. It's not. It's not about husbands. It's not about wives. That's not my point. My point is this. You are to submit to Christ like the the wife submits to her husband. That's the point. And then he goes on to say, nevertheless, the the other is true. (laughs) It's true. My illustration is true. Husbands, love your wives. That's all true. But my main point is this. Love Christ and submit to Christ. And by the way, in any of those requirements, (coughs) children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's Ephesians 6. You know what Jesus did? He always obeyed his parents. Even as a wife, Christ has illustrated what it would be like to be a godly wife. He has illustrated what it would be like to be a godly husband. He's illustrated what it would be like to be a godly worker. He's illustrated what it would be like to be a godly employer. 
In any area that you find yourself in in this world, He has already laid down the life that you are to mimic. And what we're to be trying to do, the will of the Lord, is to bring our life in line, in line with the way that He lives. So when people see us, they see Jesus. That's the whole goal of even coming to church this morning. It's to hear something from the Word of God that will help me get my life a little bit more like Jesus. And I am to be willfully participating in the effort. Amen? <clears throat> if you think of the six disciplines of the church or Christians, and you see Christ, and you say, well, listen, I have to develop those disciplines in my life. Can I say something to you? We don't have time to go through the six, but pick any of them and you'll see Christ has laid out more than enough for me. The discipline of prayer is to be developed in every Christian's life. And many of us would have to sadly raise our hand and say, Preacher, I don't really pray. You know, sometimes I offer up like wishful thoughts, like God help me. But I don't ever spend all night in prayer. I don't ever fast and pray. And Christ said, I want you to mimic my life. I've given you enough examples about my prayer life that there's plenty that you can do to start being conformed into the, the life that I demonstrated in prayer. You say, Preacher, what about giving? Nobody gave like Jesus. Isn't that true? Amen. You know what he said in Ephesians chapter 4? He said, let him that stole steal no more. Right? Is it in these passages? My father-in-law warned me. He said, you better be careful where you stop there. Right? <coughs> let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. Why? Working with his hands the thing which is good. Don't, don't take your hands and do it to produce evil. That would be like uh, planting marijuana plants and trying to sell them and stuff. Don't, don't get your hands busy doing that. Even if it's legal. <laughs> that is good. Why? That you may have to give to him the needed. Don't be a thief. Get a job. Go to work. Do some good work. Do some good stuff with your hands. Why? So you can lay out money in the bank and be just, you know, just filthy rich. No. So that you can have to give to others that are in need. You know what they said about Jesus? Jesus said, listen, I don't have I don't, my pockets are not full of money. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. I don't have a place to lay my head. You say, preacher, that means we shouldn't have a home to live in? No, you've got to take care of your wife. You have to take care of your children. Those things are known, right? But you also live in such a way that you put others before yourself and see others' needs. We live in a self-focused world. We can't even see people hurting around us anymore. Do When's the last time you just, you know, just helped somebody or been moved in your heart to give somebody something to meet the need that they have? Amen? I can't labor here any longer. Imitate Christ. Imitate Christ. What's God's will for my life, preacher? Well, it's that you let Christ be the one that's in charge. Are you doing that good? Well, what's the will of the Lord for my life, preacher? Should I get this job or that? Let's focus on what's, what's laid out before us. Amen? Imitate Him. You say, preacher, is there any other thing in these passages that we can find? Yes. Resist Satan. You know what he says in Ephesians chapter number 6 about verse number 10? Guess what he says? Finally, my brethren... Chapter 4, verse 1, therefore. Chapter 5, 
verse 1, chapter 6, verse 10, finally, put on the whole armor of God. You've got an enemy to fight. Wake up. Satan is doing his best to drive men, women, boys, and girls into hell. He is spending all his effort and time and energy and everything he can do to get the lost into those eternal flames. And guess what we're doing? Laying down on the mat and tapping out. Just as soon as we got just a little bit of problem, a little bit of difficulty, we say, oh, done, 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 done. I surrender. What? I don't know if any of you watch MMA. Do you, any of y'all watch MMA? <coughs> I'll be honest with you. I understand when somebody's been choked out, you know, I'm going out, I'm blacking out, stop. But there's just something, <laughs> I may be weird or something, but there's something I like about a guy who just go ahead and passes out. I ain't going to tap break my arm, choke me out. I am not going to tap. Now, am I crazy? I maybe don't answer that. Please. Oh, <laughs> that was a dumb question, wasn't it? <laughs> Say, you're not supposed to answer questions like that. Just get it. <laughs> I may be crazy, but I'm telling you, there needs to be something in the church where we say, look, there's a world that's going to hell. There's people that haven't heard the gospel I used to preach that thing, saying, have you heard about the guy uh, that went to an island and got shot and killed because they said these people have, have never had outside visitors? Have y'all, did you hear about that on the news? Nobody's ever reached them with the gospel. There are places like that still in the world. God may want to use you. Guess what Jesus said? If you're not for me, listen, if you're not for me, you're against me. Can I ask you something? Are you fighting the devil? Are you for Jesus? Are you trying to make a difference for Christ? What's the will of the Lord, Tom? preacher? Well, first of all, it's that he be the Lord of your life. Second is that you try to imitate his life. And listen, all of us have a lot of work to do there. Amen? Amen. I know I do. And thirdly, you fight the devil. I'll say this in closing. Billy Sunday said it the best. Billy Sunday said it the best. He said, I wish I could fight the devil. I'd beat him until I didn't have any more hands or arms. And then I'd kick him until I didn't have any more legs left. And then he said, and then I'd, I'd bite on him until my teeth were gone. All of them. And then he said, and then I'd gum him to death. Amen? Amen? Where is that in the church? We just roll over now and let the devil have his way. That's disgraceful. Christ conquered him. And now we're letting him come up like a bully. Get a backbone. Amen? Do something for God. Don't waste your life. What's the will of the Lord? Let him be Lord in your life. Start trying to behave yourself like him and start doing a work for God. Fight the devil. Amen? Amen. And whatever it is that God wants you to do this morning, I beg you do that today. Would you do that today? Let Christ be Lord today. In this one hour, say yes to Jesus. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We worship you. Lord, there's none like you. Lord, help us.